Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome back to uh, Discovery Day at Home, our online science festival. Normally, we'd be in the garden at Dr. Jen's house, um, but uh, circumstances dictate that this time we are online. I hope you're enjoying today, finding it interesting. So this is the final um, final event in um, in today's programme, but tomorrow we've got uh, another equally packed programme of different events, which you can find on our website at jennamuseum.com forward slash discovery day. Um, but to finish off today, we're really delighted to be joined by Dr. Susie Lishman. Susie is a consultant histopathologist, and uh, you may have just seen um, Susie's living autopsy, which we, we streamed about an hour ago. Um, so Susie's joining us for the next hour or so for a, a live Q&A. Um, if you've got any questions, please do um, pop them in the uh, ch live chat box on YouTube. If you are watching somewhere else, then send us a Facebook message, send us a tweet, send us an email to info at edwardjenner.co.uk. Get your questions in and we will ask them to Susie. Um, so welcome, Susie. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I wonder perhaps um, if you could um, just tell us a little bit about yourself just to uh, just to start off. So I am a consultant pathologist in Peterborough. And in fact, October the 1st will be the 21st anniversary of the day I started working there. Um, so uh, it's flown by. Um, I have a particular interest in bowel cancer and bowel cancer screening. So that's looking at polyps and things that are removed to try to prevent people from getting cancer in the first place. So a lot of what pathologists do is not just diagnosing awful diseases. It's trying to prevent people from getting them and getting ill. Um, and um, then I do quite a few other things. I'm on several boards and charity. I'm a trustee of several charities um, all around patient safety and improving care for patients. I've also recently been appointed lead medical examiner, which means that I um, scrutinize records of anybody who dies in the hospital, uh, talk to the doctors who looked after them and then talk to the families to explain the death certificate and see if they've got any questions and importantly ask if they've got any concerns. So the aim is that we would get concerns at an early stage, be able to deal with them, get answers for the family so they understand what's happened to their loved one um, and make sure that they feel happy with the care that they got and if they didn't do something about it to improve care for future patients. So you obviously the, um, the 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 talk that many of us have just watched is a, a, a living autopsy, but you hinted that there that that's just a portion of of what pathologists do. So perhaps to ask a broader question, what is pathology? So pathology just means the study of disease. So it's really broad, um, and there are actually lots of different types of pathologists, um, and they've increasingly specialised over the years. Um, because it's too much to learn um, about every single one. So haematologists, for example, study the blood um, and any diseases related to it. Microbiologists look at infections caused by any type of organism and how to prevent those infections from spreading. Um, biochemists will look at the level of chemicals in the blood, for example, to see how the organs are working. And there's about 17 different pathology specialties. Uh, mine's the biggest, it's histopathology. And so the main part of my job, I always used to say, is looking down the microscope at slides to make a diagnosis, but actually we've recently gone digital. And so now the slides are scanned and I look at them on a, on a screen, on a high resolution monitor. Um, and um, that's a really new thing. And I'm amazed that after over 20 years, of looking at glass slides that I've adapted so quickly to using a monitor. Um, and that's the majority of what pathologists do. Probably 90% plus of our time is actually making diagnoses for the living. So if you have a, a biopsy or if you have a, a colonoscopy or something and anything removed, or if you have a cancer or a lump, um, anything, any bit of tissue that's removed from you will come to, the, to us in the lab and we'll have a look at it under the microscope so we can let then let the doctors know what it is and, and advise them on what the best treatment might be. So yeah, I, so I suppose one thing I was quite surprised about is, is that yeah, there is, there is that, um, a, I suppose, a, a belief perhaps it's something that, that we've watch too many television programs where there are post-mortems but this belief that that uh, pathologists operate almost in a, a little bubble actually there's there's so much interplay between um between you and other medical specialists 
Very much so. I mean, I'm in contact with my clinical colleagues every day. Uh, we have regular meetings together. Um, so for example, anybody who has cancer, um, there'll be a meeting every week where the newly diagnosed patients will be discussed with the surgeons, perhaps the physicians, the radiologists will look at the x-rays and scans, the pathologists will talk about what we've seen, uh, the oncologists will think about whether the patient might need chemotherapy or radiotherapy, and then you'll have specialist nurses, uh, palliative care for people who are coming towards the end of their life or for whom treatment isn't appropriate, um, dietitians and so on. There's a huge team and we get together regularly. So I see all aspects um, of the patient and we very much tailor um, treatment options to an individual patient. We don't just have a, a checklist um, uh, and it's all very much individualized and it's great feeling part of that team. Was there a moment where you thought I want to be a pathologist? I think there was. I mean, I, it's not, I know a lot of people always wanted to be pathologists and that's why they went into medicine, but that wasn't it for me. I actually always wanted to do obstetrics and deliver babies. Um, and so I did a lot of my elective work where you could choose what you did uh, in that area. But actually once I started doing more medicine and surgery, it became clear to me that actually we were very reliant on pathologists to give us the answers. So if you're doing surgery, for example, um, you might cut out a lump uh, and send it off, but you're reliant on the pathologist telling you what the lump is, if it's cancer or if it's not, if it's spread or if it hasn't, um, and then what sort of treatment it might respond to. And I really like that. I think I'm quite nosy or curious, I think. Um, I like to know not just that the patient will respond to a certain medication or certain surgery, but why? Um, and so pathology for me um, was the perfect specialty. You get to find out exactly what's wrong at a, a cellular level and increasingly at a molecular level. Um, and then you can advise the rest of the team uh, on how best to treat the patient. It was interesting you saying about the, the the move from being microscope slides to digital slides and also increasingly there's there's more understanding on a molecular level mm -hmm. what changes have you have you noticed what what things have really been the kind of the big advances over your career i mean those really are the two big ones in the last 20 years um the increasing use of molecular tests so we used to be able to look down the microscope at the cells and we could say yes this is cancer but it was quite difficult for us, apart from in a few um, rare situations, to actually be able to say whether it was a very aggressive cancer or one that would just stay around and never cause the patient any harm. For example, prostate cancer is very common in men as they get older. And we know that some of them will spread throughout the body, cause problems and may be fatal, and others really won't do an awful lot. And so you can watch and wait and look at them and, and only treat them when they become more aggressive. And previously, it was quite hard to know which ones were which. Um, but with the increase in molecular technology, we can actually look at the genetics of the cancer and then we can predict according to which genes have mutated we can predict either how the tumour will act, will it be very aggressive and spread early, or how it will respond to therapy. Um, and so there are lots of drugs, um, particularly those called monoclonal antibodies, which actually um, latch on to uh, tumours that have got a particular mutation and help to kill the tumour cells. Um, and so that's how really pathologists can influence, not just making the diagnosis, but what treatment options would be the best ones to discuss with the patient. So in terms of um, anyone wanting to become a pathologist, how, how do you go about doing it? What, what, what kind of skills do you need? Um, well, you have to be quite persistent. So you have to train to be a doctor first. So you obviously have to get all the right um, GCSEs and A-levels um, and get into medical school. So that's quite a big hurdle at the beginning. Um, then you've got to do five or six years at medical school. And then once you qualify, you do two years as a foundation doctor. And that gives you a general grounding in a lot of the um, different specialties like medicine, surgery, general practice, anaesthetics, um, you know, whatever uh, the rotation is made up of, it gives you an opportunity to see um, once you're qualified as a doctor, just how they work in practice. And then you apply for specialist training 
And so at that stage, we'd apply to do pathology training. And that's about another six years or so. It may be longer if you do some specialist exams, if you decide you want to subspecialize um, and do more detail. Or a lot of people take time out to do research, um, perhaps do a PhD, which could add a, another two or three years. Um, so it's quite a long time. Uh, by the time you've added up six years at medical school and a couple of years of foundation and a minimum of six years, you're looking at 14 to 18 years or so, I suppose, from leaving school. Um, you know, you do, and the nice thing about being a doctor and being a pathologist in particular is you are always learning. Uh, so there's always something new. You know, I'm just learning how to make the most of digital pathology. I think that'll take me several years in the same way it did, took me several years to get the most out of glass slides. So you're constantly learning. So you need to be interested in doing that. Um, if you think you're going to pass an exam and then life will be the same for the next 40 years, then uh, certainly medicine's not for you and pathology particularly not. Um, you have to be curious. I think the thing I mentioned earlier, um, I have to be interested in what causes things and, and why the body works and how it can go wrong and what can be done to put that back together. Um, you need to have people skills. And that's really something um, that there's a stereotype that pathologists don't have any very good communication skills and they're not very good with people because we're all locked in basements, um, you know, doing postmortems and all being a bit odd. Um, but actually, as I mentioned, the majority of the time we're working in teams, we're working with all sorts of different people and we have to be able to communicate our findings very clearly to people. So if you haven't got those communication skills, there's no point. You could be the cleverest pathologist in the world, but if you can't get that across in a useful way um, to the doctors who are treating the patient, then that's pointless. So um, communication skills and being able to work in a team are also really important. And I guess as well, a, a significant degree of of empathy actually because uh, one thing I, I really noticed coming through in your video is the level of dignity and and the responsibility is um caring for for a deceased person absolutely the care for patients doesn't stop when they die um we're always aware that it's somebody's family member or you know just it's, it's another it's a fellow human being and generally people went into medicine um, because they cared about trying to make things better for other people and you never lose that and we're always aware that behind every again I used to say every slide behind every digital image there's a there's a person um, and you never lose that you still identify with patients you know if I see somebody who's born in the same year as me for example uh, or if you know somebody has a condition that a friend has you still think of them in as a human being uh, who could could be your friend, could be your father, could be you. Um, and none of the team ever forget that. Do you find, uh, I suppose, thinking about one aspect of your work, which is postmortems, do you find that something that puts people off of, of going into pathology? Is there an element of that? Um, possibly. Um, I think... I mean, the best way to find out if you're interested in being a pathologist is to spend some time with pathologists and find out a bit more about what the job involves. The thing about pathology, we learn quite a lot of the basic science of pathology when we're undergraduates, um, but then the actual day-to-day -day practicalities, many doctors don't ever see. So they'll see tests and blood samples and bits of tissue going off to the lab, and then they'll get the results back. And they often don't see that bit in the middle. So I always encourage anybody who's considering a career in pathology to come to the lab and spend some time with us. We're always really pleased to see keen um, youngsters who, who are interested in the role. Um, and what I find is that the more people know what we do and understand how what we do is beneficial, the less concerned they are about things like dealing with dead bodies um, or doing post-mortem examinations. But um, you certainly, I admit you, you need a particular type of person who's interested in doing that. Um, and we all find different things fulfilling. Some may like to have one-to-one -one talks with uh, their patients in a clinic environment, uh, and they may find that the most rewarding. Um, but for us, 
I know that finding the correct cause of death so that the family know what their loved one died from, so that you know their family history goes down in their family records, as this is, these are the diseases that run in our family. It's really important to get those things right. Um, and so for me, caring for both the deceased and their family uh, is a fulfilling part of my job. Absolutely. And I suppose, um, yeah, it's, it's an area that, that people, people wouldn't think about either. It's, it's something that, that um, yeah, again, is, is there an element of, of misconception from um, how perhaps you're portrayed on television? Um, well, definitely. For a start, you would think if you watch television that we were all forensic pathologists and that we spent all day sort of crawling around crime scenes in the dark um, and finding clues and things like that uh, to spot murders and things. And thankfully, there are actually very few murders in the UK. And so we don't need very many forensic pathologists. There are probably more on television than there are in real life. Um, so, you know, forensic pathologists are tiny numbers, less than 1% of pathologists work in forensics. They're clearly very important and when they're needed, they're exactly the right people for the job. But for people who die in hospital um, because their disease was too advanced that the treatment didn't work, or for people who die suddenly at home, um, pathologists like me, general hospital pathologists, um, are the ones who would look after them and, and do the post-mortems. Um, so we don't go out to crime scenes. We, we have a little bit of contact with the police, mostly just to make sure that there were no sus suspicious circumstances. Um, and obviously a lot of our work is done for the coroner and the coroner also works closely with the police. Um, but um, it's very different from what you see on television. Uh, a lot of people ask if I'm, you know, if I'm annoyed that we're always portrayed um, in that way. And actually, I think it's better to be portrayed at all than it is to not be there. Um, and it's quite an interesting hook because people often ask me, oh, well, they used to say, oh, like Quincy, which tells you how long I've been doing it. Uh, whereas now it's, oh, like CSI or Silent Witness or something like that. Um, so I think it's great that the, um, the television and the books and things about pathologists have sparked people's interest in the specialty. Um, but hopefully before people go into a career, they get a more realistic view of exactly what they're likely to be doing. So as, as we've been talking about, I suppose, what, what you're doing and, and um, what goes into particularly uh, moving towards post-mortems, we've had, we've had quite a few questions come in about um, just, just kind of expanding on, on things that you were mentioning earlier during the, uh, the living autopsy. So perhaps, um, I suppose, thinking first about the, the training, how, how do you learn to do a, a post-mortem? So um, like anything, you learn by watching somebody else do it. So as a trainee, you would go along with a more senior, either a more senior trainee or a consultant. And initially you would watch them do the post-mortem. Um, and then you would start to do perhaps small bits of it. So perhaps the more senior pathologist would do most of it and then they'd ask you to demonstrate for example how you would dissect the heart to look for heart disease and then gradually you would take on more and more of the process yourself until you could do one while being supervised and once you've been supervised doing enough and it's clear that you know what you're doing then you'd be left to do them independently and pathologists never work in isolation in the lab, we work with biomedical scientists, and in the mortuary, we work with anatomical pathology technologists. And both of these groups are highly skilled, trained, qualified individuals, um, and we work very closely with them. And they teach us a lot in the same way that on the wards, the nurses teach the doctors a lot. Um, we all work together as teams, and we learn a lot from their experience. What circumstances would you be asked to carry out a post-mortem? So there are two main types of post-mortem examination. There's the hospital or consented type, which is where it would be interesting to find out what happens, but you know what the cause of death is. And then there's the coroner's type, um, which is so the coroner who's an independent uh, legal judicial officer who covers a certain area. Um, 
they can order a post-mortem for, for various reasons. Now, the hospital type used to be a bit more common, but now they're very, very rare. Um, it's quite unusual to do those. So the vast majority of post-mortems in England and Wales are done because the coroner asks for it. Um, the main reasons for doing that are because the cause of death is not known. And that might be because somebody has been in hospital and they just never got to the bottom of what it was. It may be because there were lots of different things going on and it wasn't clear exactly which one of them was the cause of death. Or it may be because they died having not seen a doctor at all. They were perhaps found dead in bed or in the garden and, and nobody knew. So that's quite a common uh, reason for doing a post-mortem. And the other main reason is if the cause of death was unnatural. So um, if somebody dies from documented, say, cancer or heart disease, that they know they've had a diagnosis, they've had tests and scans and blood tests and things during life, and they've been treated for it, but it's got gradually worse, and then they die from that disease, then that wouldn't need a post-mortem because we have a pretty good idea of what's happened to them. Um, but if it's unnatural, so for example, if somebody's in a car accident, or if they perhaps have been accidentally poisoned, they drank some bleach or something that they shouldn't have done, um, or if the, their death was related to their occupation, that's not natural because you know, it's not a disease process that people would normally encounter. Um, things like obviously violence, um, trauma, neglect. Um, and then if there's been any medicinal or surgical intervention that may have altered the course of the death. So sometimes people have surgery for cancer, but then they die um, shortly after the operation. And we would refer that to the coroner because although the cancer itself is a natural process, having the surgery isn't. Um, and so it would be referred to the coroner to find out whether there's something that had gone wrong with the surgery or whether it was just somebody who was very unwell to start with and had a high risk for, of the surgery. And we often have things like people who've had a fall, uh, particularly elderly people who are not very steady on their feet, might fall and perhaps hurt themselves, maybe break a hip. And then that means they come into hospital, they often develop pneumonia and they die from the pneumonia, which itself is a, is a natural cause, just a, a lung infection. But actually, if it, the underlying cause of them being there and developing that pneumonia was a broken hip, then that's not natural because it's an accident. Um, so really, the, the two main things are cause of death not known or cause of death is unnatural. And that's when you'd have a postmortem. And how do you go about starting i suppose what's the the process i mean we're, we're particularly interested from uh, in terms of the theme for this year's discovery day is becoming a scientist kind of how do we how do we apply the scientific method so is, is that something that you're thinking of when you're you're conducting a post-mortem all the time so that's part of the training is getting you know we we obviously we're taught a lot by our our seniors um, and we read a lot, we read our textbooks and we read a lot of research papers that show all the emerging science that's coming through. And so you have these things in your mind. And when you approach a post-mortem, you do a lot of thinking before you even pick up your scalpel. So you would read the clinical history, find out what happened to the person, in what circumstances were they found, um, what happened around the time of their death, What's happened to them in the past? What's their past medical history? What medication were they taking? What illnesses run in their family, for example? And all the time you're thinking, okay, well, perhaps that might be this or that. You know, so if somebody's got diabetes and high blood pressure and they smoked a lot and their family members died in their 40s of heart disease, already I'm starting to think perhaps this could be something to do with the heart because they've got risk factors um, and they've got a family history. And the post-mortem I would do would still be largely the same, but I would already be starting to think along the lines of, well, this is where the evidence is starting to point um, and would pay particular attention to that area. So we'd read all the paperwork, ask any questions we might have if things weren't clear before we start, then a full external examination of the body. You can actually find out a lot about people just from uh, examining the outside of the body uh, looking for things like nicotine staining on the fingers, um, scars that suggest that there's been previous surgery, 
So, you know, for example, if somebody's got a big scar down the middle of the chest that they may have had heart surgery. Um, and so you want to be looking in that area um, or evidence of any injuries uh, or neglect. If somebody has pressure sores, for example, it suggests that they've been immobile in bed and they haven't been looked after properly. Uh, or if they're very, very thin, perhaps they haven't been eating properly. So you get lots of clues before you start to have a look at the internal organs. How long does it take you to, to go about performing a, a post-mortem? Um, I'd say between half an hour and two hours for a, a reasonably routine one. Sometimes, um, you know, if people have had a lot of surgery or they've been in and out of hospital for a long time, you get a massive pile of notes and that can take an hour or two just to work your way through the notes before you start. And if people have had a lot of surgery before, perhaps if they've had bits removed, then you have to dissect really carefully because the anatomy is not as you'd expect it to be. Um, and so you take extra care. So that might take a bit longer. But just somebody who's found dead in bed, for example, um, it normally probably ab about an hour or so would be the average. One of the questions we've had in was in relation to um, keeping you safe. And I guess that's that's something that's particularly in the mind with COVID-19 at the moment. Um, how do you make sure that if you're dealing with um, a, a circumstance where someone may or may have died of an infectious disease, how do you keep yourself safe? Um, so we do this routinely all the time. So we're constantly thinking about whether it's appropriate to do a post-mortem examination. So we es essentially do a risk assessment for every post-mortem that we do, and we always have. Um, uh, so again, you would start before you go anywhere near the body, you would have a look at the history uh, and find out what the circumstances of the death were. Um, you know, if somebody had, uh, was, stayed, was at home with a chest infection that was getting worse and they were coughing a lot and had a temperature uh, and another member of their family was known to have been on ITU with COVID-19, that's starting to ring some alarm bells straight away. So that history is really important. Um, we make sure that our mortuary is well equipped and safe. So we make sure it's accredited. Um, that we've got um, the right sorts of tables and equipment, our knives are sharp um, and things like that, um, and that it's fully staffed. And then we work closely with the anatomical pathology technologists, make sure that they're happy to proceed with the information that we've got. And then of course, we've got our PPE, our, our personal protective equipment uh, that we always wear. Um, but we now assume, at the moment, we assume that anybody that we do a post-mortem on could have COVID-19. Uh, whereas obviously, you know, a year ago, that wasn't something that we really thought about. So PPE now for a, a post-mortem, uh, we'd wear scrubs, so sort of blue or green um, scrubs, so not normal clothes. Then we have a waterproof gown that we put over, it's often disposable. Um, and that ties and that, so that's high up on the neck and round to the wrists and then down. Uh, and we wear boots. They're a bit like wellies. Um, they have a reinforced steel toe cap in case you drop anything on your toes um, to keep them safe. And so we tuck our scrubs into that and then we put our gown on the outside of the boots. And then we'd put a waterproof apron over the top of that. Some people like to use arm covers um, because we often get blood and body fluids on the, on the lower arms. And so you can get special waterproof arm covers, which just have elastic at each end, and you can put those on as well to protect your arms. And then we would put on gloves, and often people wear two pairs of gloves. Um, for the face, we have a full face visor, like a plastic visor. Um, and what we call an FFP3 mask. It's one of the shaped masks that you see um, people wearing, not the sort of surgical uh, masks. And that has a good fit. And we're all tested to make sure that the mask fits around our nose and mouth before we use them. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, so we're really covered from head to toe. Um, we're protecting the eyes, the nose and the mouth particularly. Um, but also our hands, we don't want to cut ourselves. Um, and the whole team um, would have appropriate PPE like that. And another couple of things we do, we make sure there are not people in the post-mortem room who don't need to be there. 
Um, so for example, if we've got students watching, we would often have them behind a glass um, a window, basically, so that they're not exposed to anything. Um, and we'll often have some, a circuit, what we call a circulator, somebody who um, is able to go and get anything that we don't need and bring it to us so that we're not walking around um, when we're contaminated in the room. So we think very carefully about the equipment we've got, the facilities available and the people who are there as well as the PPE. I guess there's a lot of discussion now and, and you mentioned it earlier in terms of um, if someone has come in with with cancer and they've then had surgery uh, and and then they've they've sadly died is is that the fault of the cancer is that relating to the surgery there's a lot of discussion now in terms of of how we're registering COVID-19 deaths and and particularly are people dying of COVID-19 are they dying of underlying conditions do you have a view on that at all yes I, I mean my view is that it is very difficult to to know exactly um and promptly. I think that's the biggest challenge at the moment is getting those statistics really quickly. So probably the most accurate way of finding out why people died is looking at the death certificate. And so the medical certificate of the cause of death is completed by a doctor, normally one who's looked after the patient. And that's the thing that the relatives take along to the registrar to register the death and then they get their death certificate. Uh, and then they can go ahead with the, the funeral um, uh, and all the legal things that are required. And normally the information from that takes several months to filter through and to be analyzed. And of course that's not good enough at the moment. And so um, they've been having to use other methods of finding out why people died. And so there are various registers. Re registers. So it's easy to know who's died and it's relatively easy to know who had a positive COVID test. And so those have been used almost as a surrogate for uh, deaths due to COVID-19. But of course, we all know that just because you've got a condition doesn't mean that's the thing that necessarily kills you. And somebody with COVID-19 could die in a car crash um, or of something else. So they're not perfect. The most reliable is looking at those death certificates and what goes on there, um, because doctors will determine whether or not they felt COVID was um, an underlying or an immediate cause of death, but that may take some time to come through. Just going, going away slightly from, from COVID-19, um, another question that we've, we've had come in is, do you have a favourite organ? <laughs> um, mm, I mean, I'd say from a a day-to-day -day point of view, my favorite organ is probably the colon, the large bowel, because that's what I specialize in. So if I see a pile of slides waiting for me to look at and there are lots of colon biopsies or um, if I've got a colon to look at, then that's the sort of thing that I get excited about and look forward to looking at because that's what I'm really most interested in. I think if ter in terms of doing a post-mortem examination, um, the colon's not quite so interesting then um, very few uh, sudden deaths are caused by anything in the colon. It tends to be something that causes conditions throughout the life that take a long time. Uh, a post-mortem, my favourite organ, I think, is the heart. Um, and I think that's just because it's such an amazing organ. It starts beating when we're, um, you know, still in our mother's womb and it beats up until the second that we die. Um, and so it's been designed and adapted and just works amazingly well for muscle to just be able to beat constantly throughout your lifetime. Um, and it's also a really interesting organ and lots of causes of death relate to the heart. So it's always interesting to have a look at the heart um, and see how it might have contributed to, to death or illness. So we'd have a look at the blood vessels, for example, to see if they've been narrowed um, or if they've got blood clots in them and caused a heart attack, which is very common. We have a look at the muscle of the heart to see if it's got very thick. For example, if somebody's got high blood pressure, the muscle of the heart often gets thicker than normal. Um, or somebody might have an inherited cardiomyopathy, an abnormality in the muscle of the heart. Um, so there's lots of different things that can go wrong with the heart. And it, it's, of, it's often the organ that gives you the answers. So it's quite a satisfying organ. Uh, to examine. You, you mentioned in the uh, that you had seen once a five kilogram liver. What is the 
the biggest organ you've seen? Um, well, on, on pub quizzes, the answer to what's the biggest organ is always the skin. Uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of that because our, our skin acts as an organ. It does all sorts of different things. Um, but the biggest internal organ is generally the liver. So I think a five kilo liver is probably the biggest um, and heaviest I've seen. I could hardly lift it. Um, but normally they're much smaller than that, under two kilos. Is there anything about the, the human body that still surprises you after um, your, your 20 years working in pathology? It does, and I'm sure it always will. I mean, the human body is just an amazing thing, the way it's been designed, the way it works, um, and the reserve that we have. I mean, obviously, we, we all worry about the things that will make us ill, but actually doing post-mortem examinations has shown me that actually your organs can be really severely affected and yet it had no effect on the person. So I might find incidental findings, so things that the person didn't know about during life. Um, and the body was still, still appeared to be going strong um, unt until they died. And they didn't know that they were, their liver was three quarters damaged or the heart uh, was severely abnormal. So I think just the, d the design of the human body and the way it all works together and interacts and the way it keeps going against all the odds a lot of the time. Um, is is amazing, and I'm I come come to this from a, a historical background, so I'm I'm not a not a medic, I'm not a natural scientist, um, and so working at Dr. Jenner's house, it's just amazing the the I suppose just the learning as well that's that's been done in terms of of how people like Edward Jenner, people like John Hunter were exploring the the human body and, and trying to find out more about it. Um, are there you mentioned that that you still are kind of involved in some aspects of, of medical discovery and and what role do pathologists play in in kind of bringing forward knowledge of of the the human body and helping people pathologists play a really important part um and although they may not be the first author so they may not be the person that people think about when they look at a research paper or new discovery there is almost always a pathologist or a team of pathologists and scientists behind um, any of these discoveries. Um, because it, pathology is the study of disease and we're able to look at the side effects of things. So drugs that are tested, um, people will have blood tests, they might have biopsies, that's all pathology. Vaccines that are developed, it's all pathologists uh, and pathology scientists who are working to develop vaccines. Um, so almost all research will have a pathology input, whether it's looking at tissue samples, looking at blood, um, measuring chemicals, looking at things under the microscope, looking at the molecular genetics of a, of a tumor or an illness. Um, if you look at the list of people who are involved in important research papers, uh, there's almost always a pathologist on there. Uh, but Susie, one thing I, I, one way I remember your Twitter handle is your I love pathology. And, and that really comes across is, is that you, you really do love pathology. Um, is that, a, is that a, a view that's, that's commonly held in the, um, the scientific community? Are, are there lots of people who love pathology? There are, um, and there are other, there's a whole pathology Twitter community, which I have to say has been fantastic. I mean, a lot of people think if you're using social media, then you're not a serious scientist but actually it's a fantastic way to share ideas, to learn things. Um, and there's a worldwide Twitter community for pathology. Um, and there's, so I'm, I love pathology, but there's I heart pathology, there's we love pathology, there's all these different variations on it. Um, and so, yes, it is common. That pathology really is just fascinating. It's just about finding explanations to things so you understand why stuff happens. So if you're remotely curious or nosy about what's going on, pathology is um, just really interesting. Um, and now we're all starting to go digital and look at our slides on screens. We can all photograph those and share them. And so if somebody sees something really rare or unusual, they'll put it on Twitter. Uh, often they'll put it on as a sort of quiz and say, what do you think this is? Um, but I learned so much from my colleagues around the world. Um, you know, I've got a colleague who, who uh, specializes in skin pathology in the United States. And so I always looking out for him, for his tweets um, about things that I perhaps haven't seen because we don't, don't see them so often and I don't do a huge amount of skin pathology. 
Um, so it's a great community and we do really all love pathology. You mentioned in your your talk earlier that, that you know, about some of the the myths and things that you you hear about hair and nails growing after your dye. Um, are there any other myths or medical misconceptions that you you frequently come across? Um, I mean, I suppose one's the one that I mentioned earlier, which is about pathologists all being weirdos with no people skills and who you know can't communicate. Um, and I think the one that you mentioned, which is the idea that pathology is all about death and that we don't work to help the living when in fact the exact opposite is true. And I think they're, they're the stereotypes we come across most. It's what you see uh, in the media, uh, television and, and books and things, but also patients and even other healthcare professionals who haven't had the exposure to pathology um, that, that I've had, for example, they, they also think that. So a lot of people will say, oh, you know, um, yes, Susie, you know all the answers, but not until it's too late. And I go, well, actually, <laughs> I know a lot of answers and I know them in good time because we help, we help make sure that patients get the, the right treatment and it's not too late. Um, so there's definitely a lot of stereotypes about pathologists um, just looking after the dead, which isn't true. Um, I've always liked the one about the hair and nails growing because it's the one that most people get wrong because it's just something in popular culture that everybody thinks that your nails and your hair continue to grow for a little bit after you die. And it's just not the case at all. Um, people are really quite surprised when I point that out. Um, trying to think of what other sorts of things. Um, I suppose just, just facts about the human body, about how many times the heart beats in a lifetime. And you know, I think we all learned at school that if you spread the lungs out, uh, the surface area of the, the air spaces in the lungs is the size of two tennis courts and things like that. Um, so it's a really nice mixture of interesting and unusual facts. Um, but um, that's one of the things I've tried to do with a lot of my public engagement is just try to get think people thinking about pathology and dispel some of those myths about it all being about dead people. And do you see social media as well as being, I mean, we, we talk a lot about social media and, and obviously you mentioned it being a, a useful networking tool in terms of, of finding out about research that's going on around the world. Is it also a, a useful public engagement tool? Is it a place where we can challenge myths and misconceptions as well as I know it gets so much stick for being a place where myths are perpetuated and spread? Is there a counter to that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a, it's a place for experts to be able to put their view across easily and to be able to put it in a way that that's understandable and makes sense to the public. Lots and lots of my Twitter followers are members of the public. In fact, the majority are not pathologists or scientists. Um, different pathologists have different audiences. I know some who are purely there to talk to the rest of the pathology community and they don't really have anything broader than that. Whereas in fact, mine started as being aimed at the public and pathologists have, have come along um, as, as we found each other. Um, so no, a lot, of, a lot of what I try to do is to explain things. And I think, you know, we all have to um, be aware of just everything that's out there on social media. And you have to look to the actual experts to get your information. So for example, during Bowel Cancer Awareness Year, uh, month, month last year, I tweeted something every day about bowel cancer and as a bowel cancer pathologist, uh, you know, explaining why it develops, what we do about it, what the treatment options are um, with a tweet every single day. Um, and so lots, I now have lots of people in the bowel cancer community, whether they're patients, survivors, uh, people who work for charities like Bowel, bowel Cancer UK. Uh, and so I interact with them and then I get to learn what their concerns are. Um, so I found it a fantastic resource, a great way of meeting people. Um, and particularly at the moment when I'm not actually meeting people face to face. Um, and I've been very fortunate, I think, in that I've had probably two or three unpleasant tweets, but I haven't had some of the experiences that I know some of my colleagues have, and I know a lot of people have, um, that it generally has been very positive. I think, yeah. and. Do you feel that, that science at the moment is, is under particular scrutiny? I think it is, absolutely. Um, you know, we hear about um, people following the science or reacting to the science and, 
you know, I was reading today that there've been 198 different sets of instructions to people over the last few months about what they should or shouldn't be doing in relation to the pandemic. Um, and that's the point of science is that it does change um, and that we learn more and more as we've gone through. Um, and the, there've been such a steep learning curve uh, since the coronavirus uh, came on the scene um, earlier this year and pathologists and doctors and scientists have all been learning new things every day. I mean, I'm learning more and more about what the post-mortem findings are in people who've died from COVID-19, for example. And initially we, we knew it was going to be the lungs because people had respiratory problems. And so you knew there were going to be changes in the lungs. But as we've gone along, we've learned more and more about how it has um, an effect on blood clotting. And so you get blood clots all over the body and then that can cause effects in the brain, the kidneys, the liver, and so on. So it's not just confined to the lung. Um, and so we've learned so much as we've gone along. And I can see that if you're not a scientist or if you don't read widely, why you might think scientists don't know what they're talking about. They're just changing their mind all the time. Um, but that is the point of science is that it's based on evidence. And as the amount of evidence that you can base your conclusions on grows, then your conclusions will inevitably change. Um, so I think that's a good thing, but I can see why um, it, it may appear confusing. What do you think is is next for science? I mean, obviously, there, there's so much focus now on, on COVID and vaccination and vaccine development. What areas would you like to see scientists, the future generations of scientists, the future generations of politics working on? Um, I mean, I think we, we, we never know where things are going to go. Clearly, at the moment, it's a race to get um, a safe and effective vaccine. Um, uh, and I think we're aware that although this is the coronavirus clearly is the thing that's occupying us at the moment, it's not likely to be the last and only viral infection that has the potential to cause a global pandemic. Uh, so having seen the effects not just on health, but on economies, on people's lifestyles. You know, I think it's really brought into focus just what a wide ranging effect something like a pandemic can have. And so I imagine there'll be a huge amount of work looking um, into that and looking at how emerging pandemics or emerging infections can be diagnosed, treated and prevented from spreading in future so that we don't have to face something like this again. I have to say, I, I, I often give, I'm really interested in history and I often give a lot of sort of historical talks about historical health and the history of medicine and the history of pathology. Um, and one of the talks I give is about the bubonic plague. And I talk about the Black Death and the findings you might uh, see at a post-mortem examination in somebody who's died of the plague. Um, and I've always said, you know, for several years, and it's likely that there will be future pandemics you know, like the plague, we don't know what, we don't know how it will affect us, but it's likely to happen. Uh, I think we've all seen that now. And I think there are likely to be more and more of them in the future, um, but we don't know what. So I think there'll be a lot of scientific focus um, on that sort of thing. Susie, we're coming to the, the end of our, our, our conversation now. Uh, I just wondered if anyone wants to find out more about pathology, where, where should they start? Um, what, what should they do? Um, social media is a great place to look. Um, follow me on Twitter, I Love Pathology. I'm always putting little pointers towards things. The Royal College of Pathologists, which is responsible for setting the standards and training pathologists to make sure um, that they're all working at a really high level, has quite a lot of information for the public uh, on there. So it'll tell you about the different specialties. Um, and they also hold National Pathology Week every November for a week in where, and normally uh, pathologists would be out and about in libraries, shopping centres, schools, museums, anywhere, uh, talking about pathology. This year, of course, it will be a bit more virtual, a bit like uh, your weekend has had to be, um, but there's lots going on there. So uh, the Royal College of Pathologists website is a great starting point to find out more about pathology. I mean, so uh, just a huge thank you really to to everyone who sent in questions. Thank you for, for all of the questions that have come in today. Uh, and a huge thank you to you, Susie, for, for giving up your time this afternoon and, and coming to, to tell us more about pathology. So um, we've got a, a whole well, a whole day. This is the last day of, of the, sorry, the last activity of today's Discovery Day. But tomorrow we've got um, we've got 
what have we got? We've got neuroscience, we've got um, more immunology, we've got cloud spotting, all sorts. So do go to our website, jennamuseum.com forward slash discovery day, and you'll be able to see more about what's coming um, in the, the, the next day, starting at 10 o'clock tomorrow with um, Joe Durrant uh, hosting a, a panel on science communication, which I think touches on some of the, the things that we were talking about earlier, Susie. Um, and so thank you very much once again to Dr. Susie Lishman for your time this afternoon and for telling us more about pathology. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been great fun. Thank you. Thank you.